that I saw to be the focus for this entire period in Mark. Because this is the scripture where Jesus invites us to enter the story and change. So when we read a scripture, we can look at scriptures in multiple ways, right? Find many different stories and patterns and ways to understand what's happening in the text. And so in the text today, we have the story that continues the journey of inclusion, right? We started this journey with people in Israel being fed and Jesus setting a Across the sea where he encounters more people, some of whom he's not very kind to, but who challenge him and say, even us, even the people that you don't like, deserve something different. And so then we get today's story, and it is a begins with a long, strange trip. Okay? So it says that Jesus set out from Sidon to go to Tyre through the Decapolis. So, we're thinking, you know, just along the Sea of Galilee, he's just walking, right? No, he's like going way into Gentile territory. He's going into the Decapolis is 10 pounds. So by saying that he's going to visit the Decapolis, there's, the author is telling you that he just didn't go to one pound where our neighbors who we don't like live. He went into multiple towns. He went into 10, 11, the towns all the way along from Sidon to Tyre. He made a huge trip to get back to the Sea of Galilee. That Jesus, once he was, had his heart open to people who weren't part of his community. Once he was challenged to see that everyone belonged in this new kingdom of God, everyone was invited into the new kingdom, everybody was part of it, he then set out and actually shows us he changed his mind. He shows us that the world is meant to be different than what he had even thought. He goes to all those villages and towns and cities and in those places, what does Jesus do when he enters? He usually spends a little bit of time in Bible study and prayer, because they usually tell us he enters the synagogue, right? Which means he was going there for prayer, worship, Bible study. He preaches, tells them about the kingdom. Tells them about what it means to live as if God truly does love you here and now. And then he heals them. Whether that's to free them from oppression, whether that's to give them sight, whether that's to allow them to be part of the community again, he heals them. So on this strange journey, it gets to the story about a man. His friends bring him to Jesus. So it doesn't say that this man wants to be healed. It doesn't say he has a desire to be healed. It says that the friends brought him to Jesus to be healed. And so Jesus takes him aside, away from the crowd. And then does one of the greediest healings we have, right? Because usually it just says, Jesus said these words, and then boom, they're healed, right? In this one, Jesus pokes him, he spits on him, touches him, and Jesus groans up to God, sighs deeply in his soul up to God. And then it says, After Jesus has said those words, he opened. That the man's ears were open and his tongue was released. His tongue was free and he was able to speak plainly. So on one level, this is a story of Jesus entering into a relationship. 
relationship with somebody who is hurting. Somebody who has been left out of the rest of society because they just didn't fit in right. Because this man couldn't hear and couldn't speak in a culture where everything is oral. Meaning everything that happens, most people don't write. So there's no way for this man to write down and hand people a note saying what he needs. In a society where he can't do and interact with everybody the way that would allow him to participate fully makes him different set apart. And when people have disabilities that we can see, we tend to treat them differently. We tend to interact with them differently. And so every time he was out, he was probably treated in a way that they don't treat their normal friends, right? They would do things that made him know that he wasn't the same as them. Even though the intent from people could have been good, right? Their intent could have been to make him feel welcome. But the impact of always being treated differently made him feel different. And so I wonder, because our scriptures are always brief and never give us psychological insight or detail, so we don't know the full story. Did Jesus take him aside because he didn't want it to be about his friends? Did Jesus take him aside from the crowds and his friends to find out if this is what he really wanted? Did he really want to be healed? And then, He heals him by seeing the wounds be opened. And it says his ears were opened and his tongue was released. And so when I was in seminary, by the way, I won a prize for the paper on the scripture. Um, in, in studying this, we were having this class. And I was assigned to a group. And I should just tell you, I hate group projects. I really hate group projects because I'm not in control, right? If I'm in control, it's going to go fine and we're going to get an A. But if I have to rely on other people to get my A, it drives me nuts. Because they just don't make it up to my standards. So in this class, they decided the way that they would choose people is by what scripture you chose. So I chose the Seraphonician woman and this passage, because um, they're together in the lectionary. Um, thinking that I would really like to pray about the Seraphonician woman. So my partner and I got together, and she came into the room and told me what we were doing, how we were doing it, and what she was doing. And there was nothing left for me to do. So I left, because in the moment, I am not very good at figuring out what I need to say. Like, give me a few hours, and I'll come up with the right words. So I come back. We enter the room, and I say, here's, here's a way that I think we could do both things. And she says, here's how we're going to do it. This is what you're going to do. This is what I'm going to do. And this is how it is. So at that point, I said no. Which isn't always my strong suit, the saying no part. But because she ordered me to do something, like told me that, that I had to, all of a sudden that like being the younger sister thing just shot up and I was like, no. This is not happening. So the teachers decided that it would be okay if she focused on the Seraphonician woman and I could take the other scripture and be my own group, which made me very happy. But we had to choose one of their methods of figuring out what does the text say. And one method of reading the text is to look at it and get to find out 
about what the center of the scripture is. At the center of the scripture are these words, be open. Why? Why does Mark have those words in that spot, in that moment, in that story? Because it's not like we are in Sunday school. Like I have to actually figure out the answer to those questions, right? So one of the things that I realized as I was doing research about this text is that this is this is the point at which after after we leave this story, Jesus begins the journey to Jerusalem. And so those words be open while directed at that man, inviting him into a new life of being able to speak and hear, are mostly directed at us, the people hearing the story, are directed at us So that we, as we hear the rest of the story, will open our ears to what is to come. And we'll speak plainly about what we've heard. So why do we need to have our ears open? We know what happens in the rest of the story, right? Jesus makes a tour to the top of a mountain where God is declares him as the son, as the beloved, as the one chosen. And then he sets out to Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, he challenges the religious folk about what it means to practice your faith. And they challenge him with question upon question about what it means to practice your faith. And they don't like his answer. They don't like the way he teaches, the manner of his teaching. They don't like the words that he says to them. And they see him as a threat because he's teaching people that there can be a different way. That we can live differently. That we can be different with each other. So that leads to his eventual arrest, trial, and death. And so these words here, when they're directed to us, be open, are directed to us to say, open your ears to hear what follows. Open your ears to hear the story that comes. Open your ears to experience what is going on so that you can then tell the story, that you can speak plainly about what is being said. That you can be open. But it's also a story about inclusion. It's a story about encountering those who are different from us, helping them to become whole. In the process, they will in turn seek out other people and help them to become whole. Be open. So when you think about that, where are those spots right now where you need to be open? Where are those people and places that you need to change the way you listen? Because that's part of the story, right? When he's invited to be open, his ears are changed so that he can listen. And that seems to be part of the problem. Because in my story from seminary, neither of us could listen to each other, right? I mean, yes, she was saying everything that I had to do. And I could have just gone along with it and got whatever grade she had. But for me, that wasn't acceptable. But I could have done that. I could have just conformed and been it. But I needed to learn to listen, right? She needed to learn to listen so that we could talk to each other about 
this scripture and about teaching and about how when you're in a church, you have to work together. You have to work with those other people. Group projects are still rough for me. I just say that. But what the scripture teaches and should have taught both of us is that we needed to learn how to listen to each other. We needed to learn how to open our hearts and our ears so that we could hear what the other was saying and figure out a way to meet. To speak plainly with each other, not over each other. And that's part of why this is there. Jesus tells us to be open because we have a tendency not to actually listen. So I was trained in academia because I did more than one master's degree and did PhD work. Which meant that I was really good at not hearing a word you said, but I could tear your argument to shreds. Because that was my job. That I had to be better at whatever the subject was. Because that's how you proved yourself. By tearing the other person down. Hopefully things have changed now a little bit. But back then, that was our goal. So you didn't actually listen to them to hear everything they were saying. You heard the main point that you then figured out your argument against. When we listen to people, do we do the same thing? When you listen, do you stop all the chatter in your head? Do you actually slow down? Look them in their eyes. Do you stop and just be? Ignore your phone. Ignore what's rumbling around in your brain. You hear their words. Because if you're listening to them, and you're a good listener, what you're going to do next isn't going to solve their problem. What you're going to do next is because you've been listening to them, you can ask them the question that will help them go farther. You can ask them the question that helps them to continue in the place they are. Because I know we all want to fix it, right? We all want to turn and take their problem and make it better. But mostly when people want to talk to you, they don't want you to fix their problem. They just want you to hear their problem. And so this story tells us that, right? It tells us to be open, to listen. Because when we're just listening and we've settled all of our stuff and pushed it away so we can encounter the person we're talking to, when we've done that, then those words that we need, those words that will help them not to fix it, but that show that we heard, those plain spoken words will be there for us will be there for them so that they can stay where they need to be. That they know that we're there and we will sit through the pain, the heartache, the hard stuff, that we will be there in that listening and we'll be open to what comes. That's why these words, be open, are often my breath prayer. Meaning it's the prayer that I say before I go visit before I enter the door of their room. It's the prayer I say to remind myself not to be the person who said no, but to be the person who would let their ears be open, that would let their ears hear what needs to be heard, that would sit long enough to get beyond the pleasantries so that they feel comfortable enough to say what is really happening. So I invite you to try it. Say those words as a prayer before your next encounter with a person. 
before the next time you visit your older relative, before the next time a grandchild calls. Say those words to remind yourself to listen. And then you can 